section of the Health Sciences uh, Library of the Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine. Today, on November the 24th, 1982, I'm conducting an interview with Dr. Roy B. Fisher, the co-founder of the Fort Worth Osteopathic Hospital and a pioneer friend of TCOM who is a past chairman of the board of the Fort Worth Osteopathic Medical Center and a certified surgeon by the American Osteopathic Association and a fellow in the American College of Osteopathic Surgeons who was graduated from the Kirkville College of Osteopathic Medicine in 1933. Dr. Roy, I'm going to call you Dr. Roy, you're one of my favorites, so instead of Dr. Fisher, I'm going to say Dr. Roy. When did you first come to Fort Worth, and what prompted your decision? Well, Ray, I came to Fort Worth originally in the fall of 1944. Mm -hmm. I was doing a surgical preceptorship in Kirksville at that time under Dr. Earl Laughlin, Jr., and my brother, Dr. Raymond Fisher, who later came to Fort Worth, was taking the boards, so I studied with the students in Kirksville and took the boards that fall in 1944. Mm -hmm. Then my brother came to Fort Worth in 1945. Originally, Dr. Muriel and Dr. Sam Sparks in Dallas, Texas had sought doctors from Kirksville to come to Texas and start practice. And there was no osteopathic hospital in Fort Worth at that time. Mm -hmm. So my brother prompted me to come to Fort Worth and so I bought a very large old mansion in uh, January 1946 which then later became the osteopathic hospital. Uh -huh. Now where is that located? That's located at 1402 Summit. Mm -hmm. It has since been torn down. This was considered the old silk stocking I was going to interject that thought, right, right. In Fort Worth, uh, at the silk stocking row of the century. Mm -hmm. And there were big, huge mansions there. The, the all-church children's home was on the corner, and Dr. Tuzel, who had five children, lived next door to me. Uh -huh. Then there were the Hardings and the Ellisons and the huge Wagner home on the corner. All these, of course, have since torn down. I bought this home, though, from Alan Armstrong, who was Texas Steel man here in town. But the original builder was Dr. Duringer, uh, an old-time medical physician in mm -hmm. Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, he was rather prom prominent at that time. And I can remember that there was no line in from the Texas Electric Company at that time because he was their physician. <laughs> so this is where we started. We started with two beds and ended up with 12. And uh, uh, this is how we started the hospital here in Fort Worth. It was first known as a Fisher Hospital because my brother and I started it, but then we incorporated them in June 1946 as Fort Worth Osteopathic Hospital. Dr. Roy, uh, in addition to you and your brother, uh, in the beginning, uh, who else uh, was involved with you? We had several doctors in town beside my brother and me at this time, and there was Dr. Hugo Rennell, Dr. Mm -hmm. Lester Hamilton, Dr. Arthur Clinch, Dr. Sloan Miller, Dr. Virgil Jennings, mm -hmm. Dr. LaCroix, Dr. Danny Beyer, Dr. Catherine Kenny Carlton, and her mother, Dr. Helen Kenny, mm -hmm. Dr. L.V. Parker, Dr. Hatcher, Dr. Horace Walker, Dr. Richard Briscoe, Dr. J.R. Thompson, Dr. Lubel, Dr. Fountain, Dr. Phil Russell, and Dr. Roy Russell. Uh -huh. When we originally incorporated in June of that year, we originally incorporated for $5,000. Right. And it was rather amazing 
that I remember Dr. Helen Kenny, Dr. Catherine Carlton's mother, who said she was so happy to have a hospital in town that was osteopathic. She knew she'd never be able to put a patient in there, but she wanted this hospital to go. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very good. Uh, I wonder, can you uh, reflect on some significant cause or reason that your undertaking succeeded? I know you had a number of obstacles and handicaps, but uh, there's bound to be some some driving force that uh, gave you some uh, sight at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. Here again, uh, there were no, no hospitals in Fort Worth that were open to osteopathic physicians. Uh -huh and we needed a hospital badly and everyone in Fort Worth as well as some of the doctors from outside of Fort Worth like Dr. Clinch and Dr. Fountain were so cooperative that the group as a whole was rather an adhesive group and we had many parties together. We had open houses, and we used to have Christmas parties at the hospital, and uh, the wives of the doctors would come in, and between the nurses and the doctor's wives, uh, they made it a very, very happy time. So I believe, really, that it was the cooperation of all the physicians uh, in our osteopathic hospital that helped to make the hospital succeed. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. Uh, I'm going to ask this question in sort of threefold, uh, if I can. Uh, uh, in the beginning, uh, how long was the hospital located on Summit Avenue, and what was your next move, and then when did you move to your present site? The hospital on Summit uh, was one in which we were there for five years and then in 1951 we had built the 25-bed hospital on Camp Bowie Boulevard. Uh, Where is that located on Camp Bowie Boulevard? It's close to your present site, but it's, in it's about the 3700 block? It's 3700 block of Camp Bowie, that's right, Ray. And then we were there in that building then for five years before we moved up on Montgomery at our present site. Mm -hmm. So we moved there in 1956, roughly about 10 years time, five years in each of the two previous buildings. Mm -hmm. The lot on Camp Bowie was one that, where we built the second hospital, the 25 bed hospital that was given to Dr. Phil Russell through Eamon Carter Sr. And uh, this is where we began to have quite a bit of the cooperation from Carter Foundation. Mm -hmm. Well, and don't you think your so his association with the Star-Telegram managed to give our profession a very good image and identity through his influence of what might have been put in the newspapers in those days? Did that help any at all? If we didn't have the help of the Carter Foundation and the Fort Worth Star-Telegram and Dr. Phil Russell's influence with mm -hmm. Eamon Carter Sr. Now he was Dr. Uh, he was Mr. Carter's uh, physician, wasn't he? He was uh, Mr. Carter's physician and when he became ill he of course would be in other hospitals but at one time, this is the reason why Mr. Carter resigned from Harris Hospital Board, because they weren't open to any other physicians other than their own. Mm -hmm. And the cooperation between Star-Telegram and Carter Foundation even lent itself further when we got into the incorporation stage, because if we hadn't had them and also the fact that they placed two members on our board, we never would have gotten along as well as we had. Mm -hmm. And I can remember one of the dear old attorneys in Fort Worth by the name of Sidney Samuels, who is an old, old-time attorney. Right. And he was also placed through 
uh, Eamon Carter Sr., to help us incorporate. Mm -hmm. The man never accepted a dime, and he was a very small, diminutive man, who, but he carried an awful lot of weight all around the state as far as legal practice is concerned. Wasn't he at one time, the, didn't he employ uh, uh, our good friend Abe Herman? Didn't Abe Herman as a young man join Mr. Samuels' firm? Yes, that's right. Abe Herman, who's now the attorney for the hospital, also was in that same firm right. and later, later became the attorney for our hospital. But Sidney Samuels was a jewel. He certainly was. And I, in those days, I was at the Star-Telegram, and I know his influence he had there. And he was very well recognized around the state. In fact, is he created the uh, corporate papers in Austin, which were rather unusual because of a nonprofit organization with a closed staff that we had. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Roy, uh, uh, you have hit on some highlights of your early experiences, but can you think of any other red-letter days during those early years or red-letter experiences? Uh, in addition, you've mentioned about Mr. Carter and his influence. I can remember so many things, Ray, that, <laughs> <laughs> that when I go through the some of the thoughts that you might have regarding old times in this hospital, they're, they're rather lengthy and unusual and so on, I, I know that uh, I can remember another instance in which I w went for the city uh, uh, commission in order to get a tentative approval on this building for a hospital. And uh, I think at that time the city manager's name was Mr. Jones, and I know the city building inspector was a Mr. Larson. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I was rather naive, I'm sure, to try and appear before this august board, but nevertheless, uh, I got down there and Mr. Jones said, uh, uh, Dr. Fisher, why don't you let me present this to the city commission for you? And I said, I'd be very happy. And if it weren't probably for the fact that Mr. Jones had been coached previously by Mr. Eamon Carter Sr., some of these things would never have transpired. Oh. And uh, here again is the close association between Dr. Phil Russell and Eamon Carter Sr. And then, oh, I can remember the time when we had so much difficulty with getting insurance recognition for surgical procedures. Right. And one time there was an occasion of a company, I believe they were headquartered in Waco, but the board were comprised of all MD physicians. And we had done a surgical case, and they weren't going to pay. We took them to court, and they we won, and we never had any trouble from them thereafter. Same way, Blue Cross was a little bit reluctant at one time, although uh, they came into the fold. But the insurance company with General Diamonds was really uh, very good to us from the very start. Another thing I think of so many years back is the flood. I think it was either 1948 or 49, and uh, I can remember the flood was so much that it went up to the second floor of the Montgomery Ward right. building, and there was a large expanse of water between the bridge on where we were on summit over to the next hills where now the Fort Worth Ossipede Hospital stands. Right. And there was a vast expanse of water there, and you could see chickens going down and crates and everything else in the world. There was no water in town. And uh, I had a former patient who lived out of town. He had a big gasoline t uh, truck. He used to haul water into us so we could put it into our commodes so yeah. we could flush the, <laughs> the toilets in this uh, hospital. And he would right. back this huge gasoline truck filled with water from someplace down in Granbury or Alvarado way and we'd haul water into the uh, hospital by the buckets and fill the commodes and so on. This man still comes in and uh, I, I'll never forget the man because some of these things that haven't happened to you only happen maybe once in a lifetime anyway. And um, oh the when the flood occurred, uh, we were giving uh, typhoid shots around Fort Worth, but we made quite a big play because uh, 
we gave typhoid shots to so many people, three or four hundred. We had long lines of people come in getting the shots for nothing mm -hmm. that the health department under Dr. Bradshaw thought right. we did a wonderful job. And we used to have lines oh, clear from the hospital, clear out to the street, which would maybe oh, 200 feet or more away. And, uh -huh. it, and there was a lot of recognition given to them at that time. Good. Uh, thank you, Dr. Roy. Uh, you know, in 1981, I believe you completed an expansion program over at uh, uh, the hospital. Uh, it's a little hard, I want to say FWOH, and now your name has changed just a little bit and put in the medical uh, uh, center, uh, Occupy Medical Center. Uh, I understand you're getting ready to embark on so another expansion program. Uh, what factors were responsible for this decision? Well, we did. We're only up to 200 beds right now, and we need private rooms very badly. Um, I think the fact that we have to uh, increase our uh, intensive care unit and coronary care units in the hospital because of overloads many times, but we also have um, a great number of physicians who now have come into the area between the college and the hospital itself that have uh, specialization now in what we call subspecialties in some of the various areas and the the number of doctors that we have in the area are, are growing and we need increased facilities that cover both kidney dialysis and scanners mm -hmm. and digital subtraction and things of this nature that uh, gosh, we never had in the old times when we first started. So I think with the increased physician population, uh, there will be uh, a, a great need much more than what we have at the present time. At the present time, we're full quite a, quite often. I see. Well, that's fine. Uh, wonder, Dr. Roy, uh, could you tie in your hospital activities with those that led to the founding of uh, the Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine? Oh. I know you you never did uh, forge to the to the forefront. Uh, you always were in the background or on the in, in the shadows of those who were active. Uh, but you were very influential, and I'd like to know some of your experiences. Well, that's very kind of you to say that, Ray Stokes. Uh, you know. This would date back before even the thought of a charter for the uh, college, at Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine. And I can remember Labor Day weekends at what used to be the old Western Hills uh, Motel. Oh, yeah, on, on far uh, Camp Bowie. On West yeah. Camp Bowie. And this is when uh, Dr. George Lubel and Dr. Carl Everett and Dr. Danny Byer would get together on... Uh, a, a Labor Day weekend uh, with their wives and mm -hmm. we'd all go out and have thoughts about maybe something could be done and um, um, I feel that they were the, really the actual founding members which they are and they did have the support of course of other doctors in the community sure. but the credit should go to them. Uh, what was the prime factor that influenced your becoming a strong supporter? I imagine some of the things that you've just alluded to there, but you might want to expand on. Well, well, we started the college on the fifth floor of the hospital on the west wing. Right. And um, uh, we naturally had a feeling of support for both the college and the hospital that was a mutual uh, a feeling as far as progress is concerned and the fact that you could um, have a college and develop strong osteopathic principles within the community would be a major factor in how much support we would get from the community. And I feel just if I were ever a strong supporter I would be in lesser limelight than other people like Carl Everett because he has by far uh, helped create favorable uh, cooperation between yes, the college. Yes, in addition to the past, he's still a very strong 
a factor now, you know, by virtue of his being the president or chairman, I'm not sure of the title, of the, of the TCOM Foundation. He's That's making right. a great contribution there. Well, if uh, I feel like Carl Everett, I think that uh, I have done well through my um, osteopathic profession, and if I have succeeded, uh, I feel that something should go back to the profession, and I support not only my alma mater of Crooksville, but I also support uh, TCOM. You know, in that vein, uh, Dr. Roy, I know I'm the interviewer and not the interviewee, but uh, in as much as I have been identified with the school since its beginning uh, and was the business manager the first three or four years, uh, I, I, for one, can certainly uh, appreciate and I feel like that all the good uh, things, well, there's just not enough good remarks to make about the cooperation that we got with the hospital because I know they charged, uh, supposedly you charged us $40,000 a year rent uh, for over there on those 10,000 square feet that we had. Oh, I ain't ever seen no $40,000, and I know you haven't either. <laughs> so that was a paper transaction, and that, of which that made it very possible for us to succeed. Well, I'm just happy to support TCOM, and I do so every year. Good, good. Uh, in that respect, I know that... Uh, that uh, you will possibly agree to this, and I, I wonder if, uh, I know you agree that the late Dr. Phil R. Russell was a personality who will long be remembered in the annals of Texas osteopathy. Uh, can you comment on his contribution and professional influence on both the hospital and certainly in particular on the college? Well, Dr. Phil is an unusual personality in fact, he was a character, and I, I can say so many things about Dr. Phil, but I'll always remember that he was a person who never endeavored to gain financial status for himself, mm -hmm. and that he promoted osteopathy in Fort Worth like no one else I've ever known. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's the one who was a personal physician of Eamon Carter Sr. And I can always remember the times when Eamon Carter Sr. would try and pull Sid Richardson in to put some money into the hospital and uh, whether he, Sid Richard was reluctant or not, I don't know. Either Eamon Carter twisted his arm or Phil Russell, who also treated Sid Richard mm -hmm. through good days and bad days. I see. Also had such an influence on, on uh, our growth here in Fort Worth that uh, you can't say anything uh, that Dr. Phil Russell did that would be wrong because he did so many good things for this profession that uh -huh. I think we are forever indebted to him. He was a good politician. Mm -hmm. He went to Austin and we used to go with him and he used to <laughs> show you the way around and he <laughs> met lots of people and he knew people in high places. And uh, he could get you into a lot of places with his personality. A lot of places would never attempt to go. He opened a lot of doors, I'm sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, Dr. Yeah. Roy, uh, as we come to the close of this uh, interview, uh, maybe you have got some thoughts, uh, sort of a short conclusion or a resume of of any of the personal reflections that uh, you haven't alluded to at this time that do come to your mind. Is there any final uh, uh, remarks that you want to make uh, pertaining to the identity and the close relationship that we've had the last 10, 15 years between uh, the uh, health center, uh, the hospital, and the learning center, the college? Well, Ray, my feelings are this. I think my brother, 
first led me here to the Fort Worth area and there have been so many wonderful associates, nurses and physicians and people that you meet in a lifetime that are still your friends. And I see some of the second and third generation of these people uh, that we have even delivered babies for here in Fort Worth who are now working for Fort Worth Osteopathic Hospital and uh, as well as other responsible positions around the state. And I know even today uh, we have a patient in the hospital that we have had as patients since we first moved to town in June 1946 and they're still coming back to us during these times. Mm -hmm. So I think we're very fortunate uh, in having this kind of a relationship and um, I feel that maybe this is the way uh, our Presbyterian belief in church uh, helps you to go along some of these roads you never know that you're going to go. Because mm -hmm. we had three daughters in Michigan, we had two sons here in Fort Worth, and I, I think the combination of the work and the happiness I've had within my own family and my church, uh, and above all the respect for the osteopathic profession is what really we're all hoping that we're going to continue to have. Good. You're mentioning uh, Michigan. Are you from Michigan originally? Uh, you haven't said where you're from other than your schooling. I was born in Ohio, Northern mm -hmm. Ohio, surrounded by Cincinnati, mm -hmm. but I spent uh, most of my time in through college days in Michigan and uh, I went to Kirksville from Michigan when I when I left there to start my practice. I've been I was in practice in Missouri, and I interned first in California after Kirksville in Los Angeles. In and Los I, Angeles, huh? At Wilshire Hospital, which is now a medical hospital, mm -hmm. and then I went to Missouri, and then I went back to Michigan with a doctor Northway who was a first surgeon in the state of Michigan mm -hmm. and I got the bug to yeah. do surgery and I mm -hmm. used to take postgraduate work from time to time around the United States then I finally went back and did a preceptorship with Dr. Earl Laughlin Jr. before I came here. I see. Well Dr. Roy it's been a pleasure to discuss some of the experiences that you've had in the past the, and your identity and the fact that you are I'm going to label you one of the one of the strongest friends of TCOM. Uh, we're proud to have been associated with, and it's been a pleasure to be with you and conduct this interview today. This is Ray Stokes in the oral history section of the library. It seems though that Dr. Roy's got his finger up like he wants to say something else. Go ahead, Dr. Roy. Well, I just want to say, Ray, that. Uh, Life is wonderful, and we're happy that TCOM is here, and we want both of us to grow. Thank you, sir.